Um, I would like to introduce you our first speaker this day. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Um, you had a great time, a party yesterday. Uh, so firstly, I would like to tell you something uh, more about the uh, Louis project. It's called Aragon DAO. So firstly, I would like to ask, you know, what is DAO? Just raise your hand. Okay, so, so for those who don't, DAO means decentralized autonomous organization. It means that in these days, the governments of the states, they have monopoly over issuing uh, the business licenses. So for example, you can create Czech company, Spanish company, US company, but it's quite likely this won't be true in the future uh, because now when you want to tr create any organization, non-profit organization or charity or company, uh, what you can do is just make a contract between the owner or between the founder of this organization, transfer it to smart contract, put it to blockchain, and create fully decentralized, unstoppable organization, which is called DAO. And Louis is the guy be, uh, behind the, one of the most interesting projects I, I tried uh, last year. It's called Aragon DAO. Uh, Aragon is, a, is some part of, of, of Spain. Uh, Luis is from, uh, from, 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 from Spain. And uh, he'll have a presentation about decentralized legal system. Uh, we were just talking a bit about this uh, decentralized legal system. Uh, personally, in the past, I tried Kleros. Definitely check also this project, Kleros. But I'm especially interested in the Kleros competition, which is implementation of decentralized court system uh, in Aragon DAO. So, welcome, Luis. Awesome, thanks a lot. Cool. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. Like uh, I was here last year as well, and uh, it is so crazy. Like you know, a few years ago, like you said, you were a crypto anarchist, and people looked at you like in a very weird way, like not even understanding what it, what it means. Uh, and now I, I get the sense that like, you know, places like this, probably in Polis here, or I, I was also in the one in Bratislava, like they are kind of raising the bar um, in what it means to be a crypto anarchist and just kind of extending the culture. And I think that's pretty cool, because I mean, like, as crypto anarchists, we, are, we have a very important mission. And so part of the mission is realizing the things that are not working in the world um, and commoditizing them. And so one of them was currency. So, you know, we looked at currency and we, and we said, all right, it doesn't make much sense for this to be uh, monopolized by anyone, uh, in this case, nation states. Let's try to look uh, for a way in which we can commoditize this. And, you know, Bitcoin was born. Um, and then the next thing for, uh, for me, like, you know, I was looking at Bitcoin, and I was like, this is great. But then what if we could do the same that Bitcoin did for money and for a store of value, but for human organization? Like today, if you want to create um, a legal entity, if you want to organize with people, you have to go to this uh, intermediary, you have to go to this uh, entity that has the monopoly over human organization, which is also the nation state. You have to register a company, you have to register a partnership, you have to register your nonprofit. Um, and then there are like a bunch of like super hard to answer questions. For example, can a person in Argentina do business or uh, organize with a person in Iran? And you sort of the answer is, hell no. You don't want to even start thinking about how like that could work in a legal way, in a bureaucratic way, such as uh, the one that we have today in the traditional world. And so we built Aragon. And so with Aragon, uh, we just released the, um, the latest version a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a very, 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 very easy way to create decentralized organizations. And there is a lot of complexity that I can talk about in the way we make this fully unstoppable and service resistant. Um, but I, I think that you can just go to app.aragon.org and experience it by yourself. It is very, very easy. And it is certainly easier than creating any kind of bureaucratic organization in the traditional world. So I invite you all to try it out. But then what comes next after commoditizing organization, after commoditizing human collaboration? And so we were looking at it from the perspective of, all right, let's say that you know, Bitcoin succeeds. Let's say Aragon succeeds. Let's, let's say we have all of this infrastructure to commoditize money, store of value, human organization, and collaboration. What does come next? What is the next huge monopoly that we need to disintermediate for the world to be more free? 
And we came to the conclusion that that was uh, the system of law. That was, uh, in this case, um, what I think is very important is to have a system of law that is fully decentralized and global. And so we said, all right, a system of law is great, but what does a system of law really imply? And so in this case, a system of law uh, gives you security over um, certain things, for example, private property, uh, gives you security and certainty over contractual relationships. And in some ways, smart contracts already do this, uh, but not to a full extent, because smart contracts cannot really cover everything that um, a human contract can have. Smart contracts are very self-referential, and I will talk about that in a bit. So we said, all right, in a world in which uh, you know, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies succeed, and then Aragon and decentralized organizations succeed, what is going to be the next thing that is needed? And we said, a decentralized court, a decentralized system of law. And so um, we got started from the, from the place of having a manifesto. So I think manifestos are very interesting um, because they reflect the pure intent of an organization, of a project. And so um, I got heavily inspired by the Mozilla manifesto uh, when writing the Aragon manifesto. And the Aragon manifesto is the manifesto that basically unites all the Aragon community around a shared common vision of the world. And so I think that's very cool because it's the pure state of an organization. Like it's, it's almost like the, uh, the vision, the high level of what an organization should do. And so when we look at all of these companies that are uh, just kind of terrible from a, from a human um, point of view, I, and we look back to like their origins, they usually have like very cool uh, story, very cool origins, uh, almost like a manifesto. And then over time they got corrupted and then like we don't really, like they don't really identify with that first manifesto in the first place. Um, and so that being said, you know, we have like that point to start with, that, that manifesto, that for me is in some case, is like the high level bylaws of an organization, right? So you have the manifesto, which is the vision, and then you encode that into bylaws. And the bylaws are actually how an organization should work to accomplish that mission, to accomplish that manifesto. And so right now there are a couple kinds of code that we can, uh, uh, ways that we can encode that manifesto, that vision, that purpose into actual like bylaws, into something that creates a human contract so we can all operate in this organization to achieve that manifesto or that goal. So one of them is dry code. And dry code is smart contracts. So um, I guess we're all familiar with smart contracts uh, in, in platforms like Ethereum in which you can encode an intent. So for example, let's say, um, you want to encode a vesting contract. So you want to encode a vesting contract so that a founder or an employee or any kind of contractor or person can gradually have more and more tokens in your project or shares in your company or whatever. Uh, so they are incentivized to uh, actually be there in the, in the long haul, in the long term. So for this, you can go the traditional route, which is you have like a human language contract and then someone like each month or something like that, there's an operations person that sends more shares or more tokens to this person, or you can create a smart contract. And so you can create like literally like, like 20 lines of code that basically encode this logic. And then there's no human intervention at all. You just put it on the blockchain and then each Ethereum block, for example, each 14 seconds, there are like new tokens or new shares minted for this person, created for this person and sent to them. And that's fully censorship resistant and there is no way that there is like some human corruption that breaks that. And so that's really great. Um, it has some issues though. Like, you know, as I said, like it automates everything away, which is great, it reduces costs. Um, and what you, what you see is what you get. So you can check the smart contract, send that to anyone. And it's like, you know, the way the contract works, that's it. I mean, there can be errors, uh, which is one of the downsides of smart contracts, something like the DAO in which uh, the human programmer fails to encode that in a way uh, that reflects the original intent. So you may encode a vesting contract and then suddenly uh, put something in there that doesn't do vesting, that instead like burns all the tokens and destroys all of them, uh, which, I mean, definitely can happen. Or you can have even errors in the compiler. So like, you know, all of these things that are, there. there's a bunch of technology that is almost like black boxes for a lot of people, because as, as a programmer, you just write the code um, and then things may fail. So that's obviously something that uh, is kind of a downside uh, and it's very experimental technology anyway. Um, so it is also very inflexible. So like in a human contract, in an English written contract, like basically language is like, you know, uh, your, your barrier. And with theoretically with human language, you can express everything that can be expressed. 
Um, with code, sometimes it's not like that uh, because it's very hard to encode very like subjective clauses. Like everything is very objective. You cannot encode like subjective views of the world. And then also it's self-referential. And so what that means is that Ethereum or any like blockchain that can execute the smart contracts knows about what's in the blockchain, but doesn't know about what it's outside. So the example that I always put is, um, you know, you want to hire an employee, you want to give them hardware, and you want that hardware to be returned once the employee leaves. And so um, the blockchain doesn't know about hardware, the blockchain doesn't know about like the meat space, doesn't know about this table or this barrel of water. So um, obviously like you cannot encode that in, a, in like a smart contract. But then we have wet code. Uh, by the way, dry code, wet code is like the, uh, uh, the terms that Nick Sabo coined for, for defining these things, and I think they are very interesting. Um, and so wet code is uh, human language, basically, like the contracts we are all used to uh, in the traditional world. And so they are very flexible, as flexible as human language gets, uh, in which theoretically you can express everything that can be expressed, and can reference this bottle of water, can reference this table, can reference the meat space. Um, but on the other hand, like, since it's so subjective, it is very prone to disputes because, you know, I can interpret different things. Uh, language is not, like, so objective sometimes, especially across jurisdictions and across, like, cultures, uh, because cultures also play, like, a huge um, sort of um, play in this, um, in this world. And, and also, there is, like, some, <laughs> I put it very nicely here, offline skin in the game which means that for a contract to work in the traditional world, there is uh, either jail time or violence involved. So that's what I call offline skin in the game, that like, you know, people with guns can come to your home and get you out. It's probably like the best euphemism I could probably come, come up with. Um, and then also, I think it promotes uncertainty because it is not code. Like with a smart contract, it's like literally what you see is what is gonna get executed, period. With this uh, human language contract, it's a little bit more different. And so, you know, who ensures the right code is executed? That would be a blockchain, like Ethereum in this case, uh, or any other blockchain that can execute smart contracts, uh, like Ethereum Classic or Rootstock. Um, so you have a decentralized network, predictable execution, and it can get expensive depending on the network. So like, for example, uh, Ethereum right now is like the biggest one in hash rate. It is getting quite expensive, especially when there are like um, CryptoKitties games or like Ponzi schemes running uh, on the blockchain, and then everyone is like clogging the network. So, um, but I think it's okay for certain use cases in which you really want that high security. And if you don't want that, you can always use other kind of blockchains that are like uh, lower security, but also lower cost. And so who ensures where code is enforced? Uh, that's, a, that's a different discussion. That's like governments, uh, those are uh, Trump, Putin, these politicians in the world. So, uh, I mean, they got centuries of experience. Like, I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say no to that. Like, it's true, traditional governments have been running for a long, long time. And they have a system of checks and balances that, in theory, isolates you know, the, uh, the judicial power from the executive power and all of those things. Um, the traditional system, the traditional court system, it is very, very slow, as slow as it possibly gets. Like, I had an experience of literally um, a scroll for an apartment that I was renting in Barcelona. And it took me, like I don't know, like probably nine months to get my uh, deposit back because uh, the guy didn't want to like, give it back to me. And with a smart contract, you don't even need that. It's just like literally like this is the scroll, uh, this is the party that like verified that the transaction went okay, do get it back, boom. No nine months and like hiring lawyers involved. It is extremely expensive, like sometimes there are disputes in which you are right. So there was this, uh, this dispute of like some food intoxication and a mom uh, lost uh, her, her kid. And so literally had to like spend, I think, a million dollars in lawyers or something like that to take on, it was a big corporation like Nestle or something like that, to take on this corporation. And it was like 12 years until the case was resolved. So it is very expensive, very slow. Um, and at the end of the day, what that does is it reduces fairness in the world because you have an unfair outcome. And to get there, you need to spend a million dollars in 12 years. And that's just terrible for, I, I don't know, like imagine that mom, it's just like terrible. Um, it is local and hard to navigate, so if you, if you have run an organization that has people all across the world, like for example, Aragon One, um, my, my team working on Aragon's development, we have people across I think like 20 different jurisdictions or something like that, so like it, it, is, it is very hard, uh, each like country has its own kind of regulations, and so um, it's just like, you know, not easy to navigate. And then there is unlimited liability, which means you know people with guns can come to your place, and in some places they can actually like just kill you, uh, sentence you to death penalty, and that's it. 
So, uh, what if dry and wet code had a child? It is a little bit of a joke. <laughs> I think I think John from my team called it the Ether Trump, which <laughs> which I actually love. Uh, this is a little bit scary. Um, so, uh, just don't have nightmares with the Ether Trump. It looks pretty nightmarish. Um, no, but just kidding. We are not going to implement the Ether Trump. So, uh, you know, if those kind of two systems had a had a um, had a kid, I think it would be like a dis decentralized system of law. And so, you have a system of law that is secured by crypto economic incentives. So, like, no one can like you know get thrown in jail or be sentenced to death penalty. Um, it would be orders of magnitude faster because we can use crypto economic incentives and we can use technology to basically make it faster to make sure that this resolution is way faster way cheaper because we are commoditizing it. We're taking it away uh, from a monopoly to actually, you know, making it something that can be forked. So like you have a court, if it is not working or serving well its purpose, it can be forked. There can be more efficiency. And when there is free markets and more efficiency, uh, things get cheaper, they get faster, they get better. And also community governed because like, for example, in this case, the specific court we are working on, the Argon court is going to be governed by ANT holders, holders of the Argon network token. Uh, so it's going to be basically governed by the our own community. You can also fork it and make it governed by other communities, uh, which I think is very, very important. Um, and then the only drawback is, you know, this is very, very experimental bleeding edge technology. Like we are pushing the boundaries of what can be done with the smart contract systems. So it's interesting because we are using a smart contract platform and smart contracts to implement a system of law um, that interprets wet code. So it doesn't interpret smart contracts. It interprets, uh, like, you know, basically um, human uh, written contracts. And so um, I want to get back to, like, decentralized organizations and why this makes sense for decentralized organizations and for Argon in particular. So decentralized organizations are very cheap and, uh, and, and easy to maintain and be created. Uh, they are pseudonymity friendly. You can interact with decentralized organizations without having to KYC, which for me is like so, so important. Um, there is total execution certainty. You can know that if there is a vesting contract implemented or a payroll contract in this DAO, in this decentralized organization, it is going to get executed like that. There is no corruption or anything like that in the, in the middle that can make things worse. Um, and the problem is that, as I said before, it is dry code, so it is very hard to like encode subtleties of, of, of the human uh, mind. And also, and here is the interesting point, it is uh, susceptible to 51% attacks. And so what this attack entails is that imagine you have an open DAO. So for example, let's say the DAO back in the day. Um, and imagine this DAO has a mechanism in which token holders can withdraw funds from this DAO. So here you may have a 51% uh, majority of the DAO saying, hey, I want to take funds from this DAO A, and I want to I, I wanna put them into this DAO B, for example. And so this DAO B is just 51% of the token holders of this other DAO. What happens with the other 49% of token holders here? The minority, like stakeholders, maybe they are not paying attention, maybe they just hold the token, but they don't do much about it. What happens is that a vote will go through in this DAO, 51% of the attackers will get the funds out to their pocket, and the other 49% in this DAO A just gets kind of screwed over. And that's it. So that's a very important um, attack to resolve is we, if we want open DAOs, which I think are the interesting DAOs, open DAOs in which anyone can buy a token and participate in a pseudonymous way to actually flourish. So uh, what are we solving here with Discord? So we are solving, um, well, the, the couple of things that I just mentioned, and we are solving as well the fact that traditional courts are very slow, they are very expensive, and they are just kind of a, a pain in the ass to interact with. Um, and so we can use smart contracts to make this way more efficient. So basically what we are doing uh, is creating a system of law and creating a court, as you know, courts exist uh, with jurors and with uh, with appealing systems that you can appeal if you are not comfortable with the result of your first ruling. And we are building all of that using smart contracts and creating like basically the world's first data jurisdiction along the way. Because if you have a system of law, you basically have a jurisdiction. So a glimpse into the future. Um, the idea is you create your organization, you write your manifesto or bylaws. So like basically you say, you know, this organization is going to disallow 51% attacks because we don't believe that 51% of token holders should be able to screw all the minority participants over, which is kind of how it works in the traditional world. Like if you own shares uh, in, in a company, 
um, and and those shares entitle you to like you know part of the uh, of the revenue or profits or whatever. Like usually the other like shareholders cannot just take money away from you like that, right? Like there are certain guarantees that we lack in this decentralized world right now. And so the idea is you write these uh, bylaws as the creator of the DAO or the creators of the DAO. And then a user propose a vote in the DAO, and then they stake. They put like some tokens or um, some dice, some BTC, some whatever. They stake some tokens, some value to have some skin in the game. And then anyone can review the nature of that vote that the user created. So let's say it's a, it's a vote to actually take money away from all the other participants. And they can say, all right, this doesn't quite match the organization's bylaws or manifesto because you are taking money away from these minority participants. And so then you can create a dispute. And then uh, randomly there are jurors selected. These jurors have also like a stake in this court and they have reputation in this court as well. And so they get selected, they get drafted, they look at the evidence and then they rule uh, using like a selling point mechanism. So basically you have five jurors drafted and three of them say, you know, um, the, the proposal is not, uh, shouldn't go forward because it doesn't really match the organization's bylaws then the, uh, the user that proposed the vote gets his last, so they lose their tokens, um, and then that's case closed. And the user can always appeal and can say, you know, I don't like this ruling, so I want to appeal to like uh, 11 euros, and then I want to appeal to 21, and then I want to appeal to like, you know, multiply the number of euros until you have the whole network. So basically what we do here is the security of this network um, relies on like the, like the security of the whole Aragon network. So basically, if like 51% of the network gets compromised, we may have some trouble. If it doesn't get compromised, you're okay because you can always appeal until the whole network of euros uh, is the one ruling. And even with that, there is like another mechanism to make this even more secure. But that gets into the realm of like uh, forking two courts at the same time and having them competing using footarchy, which is like a super novel governance mechanism. So I don't want to get into that because that's like that's like the bleeding edge of like the bleeding edge of like the bleeding edge. Um, so uh, right now, how it works is uh, there is this token, and so it's the governance token for the whole project, um, ANT, and it is the uh, uh, the governance of the project itself is going to use the court because we have this very interesting use case where we need the court for ourselves. Like right now how it is set up, the whole project is there is this entity, this legal entity called the Aragon Association. And there is this process for any token holder or any person in the community or in general anyone, uh, even pseudonymous participants, to propose changes to the project. So they can propose finance proposals uh, to take money from the, um, from the project's funds and spend it into like a development team or something like that. And they can also choose to change the governance mechanism itself. They can choose to do proclamations. So for example, uh, the network did a proclamation that February the 10th is the is Fight for Freedom Day, it's like Aragon Day. Um, and so this, this network, this DAO can do many things. But right now, since the funds come directly from the Aragon Association, this legal entity that did the token sale back in the day, we have the issue that this legal entity has to like respond to like a traditional legal system. So this entity is a centralized point of failure right now because it needs to curate these proposals. So if there's a proposal um, that some participant sends, which is, for example, you know, send money to this team or send money to this other team for development, um, then the association makes sure that nothing legal is going there or totally immoral, and then curates and gives their check of approval, and then that goes into the vote so the whole network can vote. The issue there is obviously that's not decentralized. So what we would like to do is write the things like the kind of blacklist of proposals that shouldn't go through, um, publish that, get that into a vote, so the whole network votes, and once they vote on it, it's going to be the court, the one that curates proposals. So this Aragon Association, this legal entity, can basically disappear and the whole thing will still work. So we need to use the court for that ourselves. Um, and yeah, then I don't want to get too much into the technicals of the token stuff. Um, then, you know, the idea is that this is going to be fast and cheap. So like the maximum time right now with the current parameters of this court, which obviously you can fork and change uh, to, to, um, to supply your needs. But right now, the maximum time that a court uh, case can be open is like a month. And that's if you appeal to like the whole network. If you do all the appeals from like five euros, the initial set of euros to like uh, all the way to the network. And one month is like nothing compared to like years in the traditional world. And this is like appealing to like a top top level. If you don't appeal, it may be like a matter of days. Like if you are comfortable with the first uh, ruling, it's like a couple of days, boom, settled. Um, orders of magnitude cheaper, 
no millions of dollars wasted in lawyers, hopefully. Uh, I mean, not even really requiring lawyers. I think that would be like my, my ideal scenario in which, because right, right now it's like really stupid that we need to hire professional people to explain us how like our legal system works. Like it should be something that people, citizens know about and that we can understand without having to hire people, uh, intermediaries that can always trick us. Um, and so, and then one very, very, very cool use case here is that we're working on this fundraising platform for decentralized organizations called Aragon Fundraising. And so the way this can be plugged together with the court is that imagine there's a case that is like a David versus Goliath kind of case. So you have like this huge corporation um, or, or this nation state, which is clearly wrong in this particular case. And you have this like, you know, super, super small individual um, who wants to challenge that mega corporation or nation state in this particular case. And it's very clear that here Goliath was the one that was wrong uh, and David was the one that was actually right. So what they can do is they can fundraise money, they can open like a token sale of sorts and they can fundraise money that goes directly into a scroll contract uh, to fund the disputes. Like basically if Goliath uh, wants to appeal, uh, every time you appeal it gets a little bit more expensive. So um, if, you want to, if you want to appeal until the whole network, it may actually get a little bit expensive. But with this smart contract, you can make sure that like, you know, if you put like um, one Bitcoin here or one DAI here into this contract, you are gonna get X percent of the profits if, they, if the court case is won. So you can basically bet on a court case being won. Um, and right now that kind of happens with like fundraisers, like I see that happening sometimes, but it's very, yeah, you need to trust a lot in the person that is doing the, is doing the fundraiser. Um, because obviously like they can just kind of run away with the money. Here is like literally a smart contract, like you put one die in, uh, the court gets one after X weeks, and then you get a return to die, for example, uh, if, the, if the court was ruled in your, uh, in your favor, or in the favor of, of, the, of, of David in this case, versus Goliath. So that's very, very cool, because I think that really increases fairness. Like you can, you can go versus this Goliath um, kind of um, giant, and still win because you can fundraise for your case very easily. And then um, finally, it's gonna be like a very easy to use web app. You're gonna have like a dispute button, and then you click dispute, open a dispute, that's it. You don't need to like go anywhere uh, in these terrible court systems that make you spend a lot of time just moving around and going to your... Also like one interesting thing about like if you're a nomad and you need to like go to a court case, you literally have to like fly for whatever you are to like where that court is located, physically located to like be there. That's just crazy. Like for me, like these things are just like architected centuries ago and they haven't evolved. Um, so we are starting Euro onboarding. Uh, now you can sign up into like a, like a mailing list to get news about this. Uh, anyone can become a Euro. Like, you know, if there's like a 12 year old kid in India that is very good at reviewing disputes and, and at uh, reviewing, uh, you know, prior art in a case and all of that, they can become a Euro and they can make a living off it. So that's very, very cool. Um, and then we are actually rolling this out in December, so you can actually like sign up into the network as a, as a user, and you will be able to basically start uh, performing actual dispute resolution on January. So I am actually January 2020, because this was this year, and we definitely didn't launch the court this year. Uh, but I'm so, so excited because we're literally like, you know, launching a decentralized jurisdiction from scratch, and I'm so excited that, you know, Bitcoin was able to commoditize money in a store of value for the world. Aragon is doing the same for decentralized organizations, and now we're trying to do the same for a system of law. So we get all of these amazing tools that a crypto anarchist are and or are as like uh, server individuals we can use to live in a really free and fair world. So I couldn't be more excited. Uh, some links here in which you can check the white paper, um, the actual code, where this is going to be, um, you know. Uh, basically uh, coded and, and programmed. It's very cool, like the people that are working on this, the programmers that are working on this, um, they are, uh, you know, sometimes they realize like, I am writing a court, like I am writing code to create a court. And it's kind of crazy if you think about it, like we can code institutions today, we can program them, we can use, you know, encode how they will work. So that's very cool. Uh, you can follow Aragon on Twitter, you can also follow me. And if you are interested in this kind of stuff, governance, uh, smart contracts, decentralization, there are some openings that we have, especially for uh, technical, technical roles. And also we have another opening for head of support. So that's it. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna have some questions. Thanks.
Okay, Luis, thank you a lot for your interesting presentation. It's time for question and answer. So, yeah, we have a question here. Very exciting work. Um, aside from staking, what have you explored for decentralized identity? It seems to be an important element to a, a legal system. Yeah, um, in terms of identity, we haven't worked so much in like our own solutions. We are trying to rely on other people that are working on it. So um, I think there are on the metadata space, so like being able to use basically like put a face to someone uh, or, or a name to like an Ethereum address, there is uh, there are a couple of alternatives. Uh, one of them is three box that I'm very excited about. Um, so you can have your own profile and your own like activity feed. So instead of like interacting with 0x123, you can see like the metadata of this person that you're interacting with, maybe even like connect their socials so you can uh, rest assured that like this person is the one that you want to interact with. Um, and then in terms of like more kind of reputation, web of trust kind of model, uh, there is one called Bright ID. They are working on basically like a web of trust kind of identity uh, system. In our case for the court, we don't necessarily need that so much because uh, we actually use relying on uh, pseudonymous participants. So we don't really need that so much. Like uh, basically we need to keep track of like a user's uh, reputation in the network. We need to keep track of the stakes that a user has, but we can do that with just basically like their theme addresses. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. I have a question. How are you going to ensure the fair trial uh, within one month trial, including all the appeals, especially in the cases where the evidence process is complicated? So let's say you have 5,000 pages of documents to go through and uh, consider if they are right or analyze them. What are the principles and instruments to ensure it. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I think for uh, when things get more and more complicated, like right now we are targeting simple cases like this 51% attack protection. When there is more and more prior art, because at the end of the day, like what's going to happen with this is uh, people are going to start resolving cases and that's going to create jurisprudence. And so that will like, really arise complexity. So um, I think stuff like, you know, 5,000 pages really seems very hard to do for like five uh, euros in like two days, I think. So definitely if that happens, we may need to like tweak the parameters uh, so like it takes more time. I mean, I would really like to see a world where like there is no like 5,000 page contracts to start with because a lot of this can be taken care of by like smart contracts and everything that is like very objective, we can uh, just put it there. And we like really use this as, as like a last resort kind of mechanism for things that just cannot be included in smart contracts. But I definitely think that if that happens, we will know when, uh, um, need to like tweak the parameters in the court, maybe. Thanks. Uh, here. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I really love the idea. My question is, uh, how is the governance token and distributed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now I think there are like 20K um, token holders. Uh, we did a token sale back in 2017. And um, I think a lot of that is just kind of distributed across like community participants. Uh, I think a lot of people also are like from development teams. So this R1 association entity owns, I think, 20% of the supply and just gives grants to like development teams that are actually building it. So in terms of the distribution, I think it's like builders and then, and there's obviously like a part of it that we don't even know who like uh, they are the owners, like actually most of it, because we did like, um, we sold I think 70% uh, or 80%. Um, and a lot of that is just like unknown Ethereum addresses that is hard to know, which is actually very cool. Like, I don't want to know who they are, right? Uh, hey, Louis. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm a very big fan of every single decentralized court idea and stuff like that. I'm a lawyer myself, and uh, I have basically thousands of questions right now, but there are two really very important ones. And the first one, how are you going to ensure the quality of the jurors? That's the one. And the second one is the enforcement, because if I understand it correctly right now, uh, you basically ensure the enforcement of the decision by locking the funds into a smart contract before the case actually starts. But it's not how it works in reality right now. So let's say I have a dispute with an Indian company and it's about 100,000 euros. I don't have the funds to lock in to the smart contract before the uh, you know court proceedings actually start. So how are you going to solve this problem? Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So on the on the second one, 
um, you don't need to like pull the money up front for appeals. So let's say there is just like uh, the the first round, then you need to just put up the like stake for that first round. If you want to do like subsequent appeals, then you can put the money there. But what is actually a, a very a very good point there is that uh, both participants like they have uh, an stake put, and they cannot lose more than that. Meaning that you know if if you got into an agreement with like a freelance developer to build a website and you want to insert up to like 5k um, dollars or whatever. Uh, and both participants put the same amount, that's the maximum amount that the court can take away from them. Uh, so there is no, like you have to make sure that basically what you put uh, in, in the stake is like the maximum amount that you are like able to like dispute. Um, because you cannot, like I said before, like you cannot take someone to like jail or you cannot like, you know, point them with a gun. So that's kind of the, of the trade-off uh, that we're making. Um, and then on the, on the first point, how do we ensure quality of viewers? Uh, like, Crypto economics kind of do because if they are not able to perform, they are gonna lose money. So that like in a rational world, eventually they are just gonna like stop being yours. Um, so that's that's the way that we make sure of their quality. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I was working on BISC for a while, and we also have a kind of dispute resolution system. So questions like this came up. I, I have maybe one remark and one question, and the remark is that n so this is like a court for internal Aragon matters, and, and not every dispute that I have in life in an organization goes to court. Sometimes, very often, it was solved inside the organization, and then it was done very quickly. Um, so it seems to me like a good way to solve disputes in a dissenters organization, not necessarily in, 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 a co in a court between random people, which is a bit different thing, but it's just my point of view. And the other question is, as you pointed out, the court system is slow. We have lawyers, it's expensive. We have courts, it's overwhelmed. But, but this is not because of the jurisdiction issue. This is because you need to phrase an agreement which shows the intention between two individuals in a way which is understandable for everybody. And not everybody can be a judge, even if you do the appeal system, which is supposed to ensure that if one layer makes a mistake, you can appeal. And I'm, I'm not sure what will happen in, in your system if it starts to be popular and it, you, win, you won't find that you reinvent the wheel. So that's kind of a question if you're not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. So do you mean like if if euros if you if we cannot ensure the quality of euros you just get like populated with like a bunch of random people that don't know how to rule? So you would need somehow to phrase the agreements which are being courted, and how do you do that eventually without lawyers in the way that the people who judge us, which are mm, the jurors, okay, understand okay. it? And yeah. then the quality of the jurors. I mean, there is a reason that not anybody can be a judge in mm. in, in classical court, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely not worried about that in the sense that they will just lose money if they are not uh, good jurors. Um, I am definitely concerned about how to encode the agreements in a way that is understandable. Like, I mean, I think a lot of the a lot of the parts why we need lawyers today is like cross jurisdiction kind of trade. Like, I definitely disagree on that. I think that's a huge part of it, and, I, and I've been working on on that with some lawyers, and it's just like a pain in the ass uh, to deal with a lot of this complexity. But I do think that on the other hand, like there is a need to encode that into like something, so, some human readable agreement that everyone can understand, and that's why sometimes we use lawyers. Um, I hope we can automate a lot of that uh, with stuff like AI and just kind of you know creating agreements or reusing agreements or open sourcing them. Like a lot of uh, today's agreements for uh, at least startups, for example, uh, you use basically copy and paste like existing ones because you can like open source them. So I hope we can. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to get rid completely of lawyers um, like in the foreseeable future, but I think we can really like reduce the amount of lawyers uh, and their costs that is needed in the future. Thanks. Do you have any plans to done, do trials or tests comparing your mechanism to some other mechanism in some sort of controlled environment to show yeah. that it actually works better than something else? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the good thing about this is uh, you can model it, you can you can create agents, uh, like rational agents that start trying it out, but I think the, the best way to actually try it out is launch it and see how disputes work. Uh, so I think we're going to get a sense of that like as early as Q1 next year, and I'm super excited. I mean, it's a huge experiment, right? So like, it may fail the first time, it fail the second time, uh, but I think the, uh, just creating like a decentralized court, uh, we're going to learn so much. Over here. Um, it's very interesting. I, I realize right now that you wouldn't uh, try any murders or this kind of dispute, of course. But in combination with Mr. Hanson's yesterday um, presentation about putting a fine as a, um, as a penalty for any kind of uh, 
a lawful action and also having vouchers paying for it, then probably this combination becomes more interesting for a complete, let's say, system that uh, takes away both prosecution and also trying of cases from the state. What I can understand in, in this very interesting case, how would the market between courts operate? Um, a voucher maybe, and uh, an, an offended person, and we have to go to court, how would we choose Aragon instead of another one? Mm. Would this have to be drafted um, yeah. beforehand, or who, who would enforce mm. trying my case with a voucher from an offending person with you instead of another court? Because maybe yeah. courts may also have some kind of constitutional biases, you know? Some could be more liberal, other more conservative, or whatever the case might be. So how would the market, mm. monetary maybe, would operate in this case? Yeah. I think it's similar to how you choose um, like private mediation mechanisms. So you basically start a contract with someone and you say, you know, instead of using uh, the like, traditional court, we're going to use this mechanism as like the first resort. Uh, you can do that. Um, then, I mean, I think it's, it gets way easier when like your organization is on chain because this is like native to on chain organizations. If not, you will have to like draft a contract saying, you know, we are we are going to resort to this like private mediation, the SDR on court, before going into like a traditional court. For a, for a murder? I mean, th definitely that wouldn't work because like, I mean, this has limitations, for example, murder, like you cannot, um, I mean, well, actually, you could like you could support evidence that you murder like, or, or other person murder someone, but then um, like the maximum thing will happen to you is you could lose your stake. So like for certain things, I think this may not work that well because uh, like uh, I'm, I'm sure if like someone who used more than other person, uh, you know, should use like loose tokens. Probably the repercussions should be bigger than that. But that's like a philosophical kind of discussion. Um, your focus seems to be on making the law cheaper and faster, not so much on better outcomes. So I'm wondering, is there a possibility you're just going to increase disputes between people because that uncertainty that exists in the current court system? So you may just weaponize the law system. And so every little thing becomes like you've created a playground for um, criminals and bad guys to create disputes and take mm -hmm. care of your system. I'm just, this is some bug in your system that could possibly be exploited. Think of the, the DAOs originally yeah. Uh, and how they quickly were exploited by bad guys, and we ended up with Ethereum rather than Ethereum Classic. How do you see that it doesn't focus on uh, so much on like better outcomes, or is it like a perception? That's my perception from okay. the talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I got the sense you're more focused on making the law cheaper and faster rather than trying to figure out how to mediate disputes in a like for better outcomes. Yeah. I mean, definitely better outcomes is like very, very important. It's actually like, I would say number one thing. Um, I just focus on the other two because that like in a comparative way, like I would say the court system we have today resolves like focuses on better outcomes uh, a lot. So I think the issues that it has is more like around efficiency. So that's why like I focus much on that compared to like the other, other stuff. Um, I think in terms of outcomes, uh, we will just see how it works, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's gonna have like worse outcomes than the traditional uh, court system. Like, if any, I, I, I think there is one uh, core principle why they can be better, and it's that uh, being like a global court, like, I think the results are going to be more like canonical and less local, which may be like good for some cases or bad for others, but I think in general for like, I don't know, like freelancing or stuff like that, it's like nomad kind of thing, it's going to be better. Okay, so I haven't read your white paper, so maybe I don't understand about the better outcomes, but have you thought about the economic incentive if you make it? cheaper and faster. I think many of the reasons people don't enter into legal disputes is the huge cost, Yeah. right? And if you make it cheap to sue your counterparty, um, you could create a, a firestorm of legal disputes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's not only the cost, but also what you lose in the process, so like your stake. Uh, so like the cost is obviously low, but like the stake you may put is actually high. Like let's say uh, you're interacting with a very important contractor of yours and you have like a huge stake of like 100K dollars, then you may lose that and you like go into a, into a dispute. So you still have the incentive of like not going into a dispute. 
Um, I think what we are doing is commoditizing it. So certainly, it will be easier if you want. Like you, you could literally create like a um, like a stake of like one dollar and then go into a micro case uh, for like that one dollar. Um, I think maybe there is not much incentive to do that because like the cost of like going through a process is going to be bigger than like the dollar deposit that you put. Um, but yeah, I mean it's kind of hard to to answer how this is going to work out. I think we're just going to see in like a few months. Uh, so I have a question more about uh, the um, the quality of the ruling. What are the mechanisms to remove the bias of the jurors? I is there any or just to remove the bias? Yes. Yeah, so okay. let, let's say I'm asking for ruling, but the person that will be ruling could be biased in, in the mm -hmm. uh, in the outcome. Yeah. So uh, there is this selling point mechanism where, for example, let's say you have like 21 jurors that are ruling your case, uh, you will need a majority, so like um, 11 of them to rule uh, for an outcome, for that outcome to be accepted. Um, so if there is just one that is biased, then that doesn't really matter so much. Uh, if the 21 of them or like, you know, 11 or 12 of them are biased, that's a different thing. And you may have to like appeal to the next, uh, to the next round of jurors, which is going to be drafting more and more jurors and you have the whole network. And so basically what you have to rely on or trust on is that 51% um, of this network uh, is not going to be biased. And I think if they are global participants around the world, like uh, the likelihood is that they are not going to be biased. Uh, but certainly it's something that we have to care of when like onboarding jurors, make sure that there are a lot of them and also that uh, they are pretty global and like from different backgrounds. Hi, Th thanks for your talk. Um, is there a way you can bribe the jurors, like in traditional systems with jury, the right. juries are used? Yeah, I mean, you could definitely do that. There is um, there is an interesting uh, mechanism, which I don't know if I recall correctly, but it's something like if you can predict the outcome or like the vote of a juror before it's settled, you can like slash them, so you can uh, you don't you don't get that. Um, you can like prevent a little bit of that incentive of like then communicating beforehand. But you can certainly bribe them. The thing like that comes back to, and actually you can do like better bribes because it can be like an on-chain bribe. So like it's literally like a smart contract bribe kind of thing, um, which th there is no trust involved. But the thing there is, as I said before, like if you have like 21 euros, for example, you will have to bribe 11 of them. And even with that, you can always appeal to the next to the next one. So like you will end up having to bribe 51% of all the network. Um, and even with that, there is this like uh, kind of like um, food key fork mechanism that I was sort of like talking uh, about before, which I mean, I can go a little bit in, in detail, but basically it will create two different courts and then uh, decide on the price of the native token of the court uh, in these two different courts, or what is the price that is higher. And so the price that is higher, you could assume that is the court that is actually working because everyone in the system is it's in because they believe that the court is going to work. And so the price is higher, you can basically um, just the bank, the like shorter, the, the like, um, the like other four can go in this direction. So basically TLDR is that you have to bribe 51% of the network and even with that there is this like last resort mechanism uh, which is forking it into two different um, courts. You mentioned the uh, onboarding jurors. So is there a specific process or is you just need to hold the token and be a juror? Uh, right now, I think we literally have like a mailing list for them to like uh, sign up for news. Uh, but then in December, what we are going to have is uh, this bonding curve. So basically this, how to say, um, this way in which you're going to be able to stake ANT, so this uh, Aragon Network token, to get ANJ, which is the Aragon Network jurisdiction token, which is like the, the one that jurors use. And so uh, we have like these two to like isolate crypto economic incentives. So like we don't align like super weird different incentives. So the, uh, you will be able to get like this, um, this token that will allow you to be a user basically in the network. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, if not, I would like to uh, thank you at all for your, for your question. And big thanks to Luis for his interesting presentation and, and comprehensive answer. Thank you a lot, Luis. Yeah, thanks, man. Muchas gracias. Gracias. <laughs>